somebody's yeah. got a broken HVAC, it's 110 degrees, their wife is pissed, and they need somebody out right now. We gotta be picking up the phone, responding to this lead. Hey, this is Nina. I'm the AI digital assistant for Cooler Garage Doors. I can get your call booked in 90 seconds. That's funny how all it takes is asking the right question to the right person to save you like potentially years of development time and spinning up a new product or service. All your efforts are reflected in what the P&L says, right? No matter how hard you work, that's the outcome. There's going to be calls that we're going to escalate that are very complicated. If, if you're at a point when I'm growing, I, I've got multiple technicians, the revenue supports it, earnings supports it. You're going to be integrating AI. I need a CSR that can fill the gap for the stuff that AI can't do. That, that's where I would start. What's the scuttlebutt? So, what is the scuttlebutt? Anybody hear anything? Scuttlebutt! The definition of that word is a rumor or gossip. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Brock Briggs. I'm the host of the Scuttlebutt Podcast. On this show, we talk to veteran business owners to learn how to better start, buy, and scale businesses. Today, I'm talking with Charlie Felker. Charlie's former Army and after an exit in the home services space, started a white glove customer service business. Feeling the pains of scale, he pivoted the company to an AI-powered voice business, which threw gasoline on their growth. In this conversation, you'll learn from Charlie, an expert in customer support, what the true role customer service plays in your business, the options and cost advantages of AI bringing to a business uh, in the home services space, and where he thinks the role of AI is in support going forward. And here's a hint, his argument completely changed my mind about AI and customer service. To get this teed up, the following two minutes is a clip of a real interaction his AI support service had and it's going to leave you wondering why you haven't already implemented this in your business. If you're interested in checking this out, the company is called Free to Grow. Links in the description below. Tell them the scuttlebutt sent you. Here's the voice clip followed by my conversation with Charlie Felker. Thanks for calling Peerless Fence Group. How can I help you? Hello, my name is Lindsay. Um, I'm calling because um, we had a pretty bad tornado storm and um, a part of our fence came apart and I was calling to see if someone can come to put it back together. Sorry to hear that. We can definitely help with the repair. Could I have your full name and please spell it out for me? Yes, Lindsay L-Y-N-D-S-E-Y and last name Norris, N-O-R-R-I-S. Thank you. Is the number you're calling from a textable number? Yes. Great. What's your zip code? 46217. Thank you. What's your address? Can you spell it out for me, please? Yes, it's 3032 A-M-A-N-D-A-L-Y-N. Drive, Indianapolis, Indiana. Got it. What's the size of your existing fence? Is it more or less than 60 feet? Um, I think it's less. Thank you. What material is your fence made of? The white PVC. Thank you for that information. And how did you hear about us? Um, so we had had it put together through, I think it was Home Depot or Lowe's. Got it. Are you the owner of the property? Yes. Is this for a residential or commercial job? Residential. Thank you. We'll have someone from our team call you back to get the job set up. Is there anything else I can help with? Nope, that is it. Great. Thanks for calling Peerless Fence Group. Have a nice day. Charlie, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with me today. Why don't we start off with a couple of minutes about you? You want to give us a maybe touch on your military experience briefly and then what gets you here uh, in front of me today? 
You bet, Brock. It's been nice getting to know you. I appreciate you having me on the podcast and certainly for this avenue that's very much veteran related and leadership proven, et cetera. So I'm a St. Louis native. I, I went to West Point for college. I entered West Point in 2002, so though it's obviously a lot going on in the world. Graduated in the class of 2006. I was a proud infantry officer, which was a popular theme in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that was a very popular gung-ho thing to do. So I was commissioned an infantry officer. I was my first coast and kind of slot or job was with the 82nd Airborne. I took, I went to Raider school and then took over a platoon with the 82nd and finished up Raider school. And then a few weeks later, got to Fort Bragg. And then maybe a week or so after that, I was on an airplane to Afghanistan for about a year long deployment. Um, had a great deployment, learned a ton. I was at this kind of small fire base on the Pakistani border. Loved it. It was an intoxicating experience commanding a platoon in the infantry, being on the front lines and seeing how the war was going. Got back, tried, and then failed to to get into the Ranger Regiment. I had a kind of a heat stroke when I was going through my first assessment process, was lucky enough to be given a second chance, and then was accepted into 3rd Ranger Battalion at Fort Benning. I did two deployments to Afghanistan as a platoon leader, and then did a final one as a company executive officer in DECO 37. And so this is May of 2011. And as you all know, in May of 2011 is when we killed bin Laden. And so I was thinking about what am I going to do next and felt like it was a good time for me to get out. And I did. And so I did my five years and we had gotten the guy that we wanted to get to begin with. And it was just a good time to get into my next phase of life. So got out, moved back to my hometown of St. Louis and went to Wash U and at, it's a Washington University is a good school here in St. Louis and did the MBA program. And, um, I have been an entrepreneur ever since I, I got into kind of a home service business doing aging in place modifications, keeping people in their home longer. People often equate it with the stair lifts that you see go up and down people's stairs or door widening or platform lifts or ceiling lifts or elevators. So I, I built up a, a nice little business in St. Louis, and then I bought another business in Western New York that was doing something similar. And in 2019, I was approached by a big strategic buyer, a company that, that makes and distributes wheelchairs. And they said, we've got all these wheelchair clients, but how are they getting in their home or up the stairs or out of bed? And so that's what you do, Charlie. And so let's partner. And so they bought my business. And I leveraged that experience in that industry to, to build the endeavor I'm working on now which I'm sure we're going to get into, which is, has morphed a couple of times in and of itself. But yeah, I think my time in the military is, I think about it a lot every day, I'd say. The people, all the experiences, I think I'm definitely more relaxed now having gone through, you know, relatively intense times in deployment or with good kind of aggressive units. So I, if I had to do it all over again, I, I certainly would. And I get more fond of my experience as the, as the years go by. A lot of those thoughts and feelings about the service resonate. It is interesting how the volume on life gets turned down pretty significantly when you get out of the service, that everything is much less noisy. And it's you know, like, man, I, I've dealt with much more stressful situations than this. Certainly being shot at and staying up for multiple days on end, coming home by five or six o'clock every night is not too shabby. Yeah, I was laughing with my wife because I was, remember, I remember my first few days of business school. I literally had been at Kandahar and then I got out. We took a little family trip for like 10 days and I started business school. And people are coming in five minutes late with coffee. And I, I'm like hyperventilating for these people because you're just so used to that. Let's go. <laughs> and so it was good. I took, you got, got to decompress a little bit, but yeah, very true, Brock. Yeah. I had a very similar experience. I uh, took a go at college prior to joining the military and it didn't go well, needless to say, but coming after taking another stab at it after the service, everything just it was much more clear about what to do and how to get it done. And certainly oh, yeah. showing up to class late was not an option. Yeah. Just, yeah. I'd love to, let's talk a little bit about your first business. A lot of home service businesses have very similar through lines. They all do different things, but all home service, they have these common trends that flow through them. I'd love for you to maybe take a couple minutes and talk about 
anything that really stuck out to you while you were running that as significant pain points or areas of the business that you maybe learned the most from? Yeah, you. So when I sold my company, it was asset sales. So you get to keep your cash and your AR, and then there's typically a multiple earnings. Very typical. I, I really look back when I was selling my company, my wife and I had put together some things of when did I do well and not well, and what would I have done differently? I felt like I spent the first kind of few years, like trying to figure out where my customers are and how to go get them, like basically customer acquisition. And I probably was very naive and probably should have spent more time before launching the business looking at what other companies in this space are doing and have some very candid conversations. Look, home service company, you're in the space. I'm thinking about doing this and what have you seen and how did it go? And you were starting over, what would you do? I frankly didn't do that. I think I was probably a little too, too competent and you know, and I can hustle and I can grind this thing out and I'll go find people and I'll hire good people. And before you know it, this thing will be, be going smoothly. And it did get to that point, but. It took a couple of years to really figure out, man, I got to invest more in like pay-per-click or I got to go get these new like referral sources and payer networks and I got to work with insurance and the VA and I got to do these five products. I started out only doing two and people had gone through that experience well before me and I just didn't take the time to take a couple months and do like a, a little tactical pause per se and say, what could I, I could go call somebody and doing it in Chicago or Pittsburgh and not competitive markets and say, hey. What do you do? What you, what were mistakes that you made? I'm thinking about doing this. Tell me more. And people typically I felt are open to telling you. I just didn't do that. I also, I also had roles and people on payroll that I, looking back, didn't need. And that's a big impetus of how I started my company now is like the customer service role, right? It's very different if you're running a big HVAC plumbing company and the phone's ringing off the hooks. We were getting probably five to 10 phone calls a day. We were getting emails from case managers as referrals and a lot more kind of not quite as important to get onto it as fast as possible. But I had a full-time CSR for three years. And so I'm like, you know, what can I have done differently? It's probably 20 hours of, of work a week. Do I, did I, do I outsource it? Do I have a VA or what could I have done differently? Because at the end of the day, all that cash compounds over time and you, you get money for your, your acquire via multiple earnings and earnings took a hit that way. So I, I had definitely some tactical things I could have done differently, but I think, I think I could have done a better job early on collecting more facts and putting together a better roadmap. I just felt I'm young, got a ton of energy and I'll figure this out, which I know a lot of people do. So we're going to stay. Yeah, I think yeah. it's uh, it can be a rite of passage, but while as we're talking about this is exactly why people in home services and specifically veterans love talking about this because they have the ability to maybe save somebody some pain in the in the future. If you had to narrow down the things that you would look for or try to find out prior to getting into an entry in an industry like that, are there maybe a couple of questions? I won't pin you to just three. But let's say three questions that you would want to ask, like somebody who's been in the industry and maybe something that somebody else that's entering a new market or industry could use to, to ask. Yeah. It's interesting because that is a, that dynamic or that my customer is this aging in place customer, right? So there's definitely insurance dynamics or payers or insurance companies that are reimbursing for these products and they're really good, smart players in that space and kind of figure those out, right? They weren't necessarily doing the pay-per-click net fight. They were saying, you know what, I'm going to go spend, I'm going to, I'm going to go meet with UHC or some big private insurer and take a, take a couple of months, but get in really deep with them, get all their case managers to like me, demonstrate that I've got qualified technicians and can get these products installed. Like I'd say I would and take care of the customer and pick up the phone and answer questions. And they do that and then all of a sudden they're good with these big payers and they're focused on that and getting very cheap leads, high converting leads. And then you got other people that are just focused on outspending each other on Google. Um, that's very specific to the market that I'm talking about, but yeah, I, <laughs> you learn those things like what products do you sell? Oh, why do you sell them? Okay. 
you said you're just only doing two of these while other companies are doing five. Why are you doing these two? These companies will pay for this and this. The VA, your veteran, Charlie, is going to pay you for this and this. Ah, I get it. Makes sense. How'd you get to the VA? You got to go talk to this person at prosthetics, go meet with these people, go to this in service, these trade shows. Ah, okay. I got it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's getting your ducks in a row and talking to the, like the top dogs of what made them and what did they learn along the way to spend time on what they're spending time on. Cause high likelihood that they've made some mistakes and said, no, not worth it. Not going to sell this product, not going to drop down to this pricing. I'm just going to focus on these three or four things and be really good at that. Yeah. It's funny how all it takes is asking the right question to the right person to save you like potentially years of development time and spinning up a new product or service. And you just wouldn't have known unless you would have talked to somebody who's they've spent 20 years doing that. And they're like, yeah, here's all of the reasons why it doesn't work. So unless you got some kind of innovative model or some kind of different strategy that nobody's tried before, it may be best to leave this alone. And if you're like, if you're a veteran, like transitioning out or transitioning from a, your current job to something else, you want to buy a business. I found it very effective to, to introduce yourself as a veteran. I've got no problem doing that. Look, I'm getting into space. I'm an army veteran. I'd love to pick your brain. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to give you the keys to the castle, but I felt like there's a higher, like open rate per se. Like there's going to be a willingness to pick up the phone and talk to you and engage. Because I, I do think people want to help out. I really do. I think that's a very, it's said a lot, but not used as much as it should be. Especially if you're junior, if you've been out of the service for 20 years, you, it, it carries a little bit less weight, but especially for transitioning, like everybody has been through that experience and understands how painful it is and how it's easy to feel very lost. And everybody's will take at least one call for you yeah. to do something. Well said. Absolutely. You talked about the role of customer service in your business, and it sounds like you maybe had a full-time person that was maybe doing part-time hours and maybe, maybe didn't see the, to need to have them that much, or maybe could have looked at some alternatives for having that role. What were the ways that you were thinking about measuring how valuable customer service was in your business? Was it, was it lead follow-up? Was it Hey, I did this many follow-ups, this many outbound calls. What were those things that you were using to say, this person it needs to be here and has a place in the business? Or yep. was it just, yeah. hey, they were here when I got here, so I'm just going to ride with it? Yeah, the, the, the slippery slope is that when you're building the business, or at least this is my experience, right? You're just trying to get the phone to ring or, or emails to come in, you know, asking for what you provide, right? Can you come out and be a quote, essentially? So anything, any call that would come in and be like, oh, it's great. It's, I don't have to answer this call. I've got this wonderful person who can do this. But over time, yes, you're like, okay, I've got now a salesperson, right? So I've got to keep the salesperson as a, as a Megan. They've got a base salary. They're getting a percent of all revenue. To make the economics work, I've got to get three appointments for this individual every day, right? They're going to convert 50% of those. And so that sense of urgency, at least from when I was looking at was, okay, if we're having three day phone rings, I started paying a lot more attention to how fast it's picking up. What's the call script, the trial and error there. Okay. If, if we, if we're not scheduling, why isn't it? Certainly there's some, you got to qualify people, right? Sometimes people with a ramp, for example, or a sterile, if they're ceiling, they think it's a hundred bucks. It's really four grand. So there's always these like things that you've got to learn. You got to pick it up. You got to sound good. You got to sound competent. You got to know the products and services. And then ultimately you got to book the salesperson because they need three appointments today. So I think my mindset changed and could probably mature over time. I was like, the first couple of years, I'm like, oh, this is great. Somebody wants me. And then that gets to like, okay, I'm past that. I've got somebody that I need to keep busy to pay the bills. So on, I got to manage like under five minutes. We got to be picking up the phone or responding to this lead. So I had certain KPIs like that, right? I looked at booking rate. I looked at like how we're qualifying versus what the close rate is for the salesperson. So if we're just saying, yes, we can come out, come out tomorrow, Friday without any kind of qualifying questions. Yes. Maybe we're putting, we're scheduling more evals, but the eval conversion rate was not as good. 
because the salesperson gets out there and the person's like, I thought this ramp was going to be a hundred bucks. It's actually 10 grand. Certainly bob and weave, and you certainly get to a point where you're maturing. You can start to introduce KPI and metrics, et cetera. The difficulty was phone wasn't ringing that much, right? Booking three appointments a day, person's there for eight hours. You're like, yeah. So then you try to introduce other stuff like outbound calling campaigns, putting, you know, service agreements in place, preventative maintenance agreements. You just start looking for something for these individuals to do, which got frustrating for me. So at the end of the day, I'm like, I, when I sold my company, I did some math. I'm like, I'd probably leverage this individual 20 hours a week. Went through three, three or four of these people over the years, right? Probably cost me five to eight grand per person to train, teach them how the CRM works, teach them how to qualify calls, teach them the products and services, frequently asked questions, working with the salespeople. Where do we go? Where do we not go? How do you work with these different insurance companies? If you've got to submit like a letter of medical necessity, what does that look like? So there's a lot that like goes into these training and then they leave or quit or do something else. And so I just looking back, I was like, man, there's got to be a better way. Got to be a better way. And so free, I started free to grow right when I sold my company and we were basically scratching that itch. I was like, okay, a lot of guys like me probably need somebody 20 hours a week. So we're going to, we're going to build a stable of CSRs to answer phones, schedule, manage the CRM, do some outbound calling, maybe do some other admin tasks, but hit the main blocking and tackling of what the, the CSR role is. So that's how free to grow was really launched was my frustrations with running my little home service company. <laughs> how, how quickly did you launch it and what were your, did you have any kind of thoughts or ideas about what a, an outcome looked like for that? Was it just, this problem is so painful. I have to go solve this. Was there a downtime of moly on your options and thinking about just heading to the beach forever? Or was it well, like, no, I'm ready for the next thing already. I was ready to go. Cause I, 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 let's see, I was under LOI for probably 90, 100 days. The company that bought me when they're closing 90 plus percent of the deals when they get to LOI. So I'm like, this is probably an out unless something crazy. We liked each other. There was going to be a great destination for my employees. I liked it strategic direction made everything made sense they had an office great healthcare, right i can i can sell this to all my employees this is just a better frontier for them versus me running this thing when i had been in my mind i think an loi i was like okay i gotta figure out what's next uh, doing the mental exercise of going through the last five years six years of my life when i do not well what were the frustrations i'm like man there's, there's a little rest of business here right how many HVAC other operators, plumbing, roofers, electricians. We had, we've done some cool niches like dumpster rental. There's so many interesting opportunities where people could leverage some sort of white glove outsourced or fractional CSR business. And so we did it. We you know, I have a great partner now, Nathan, we went to high school together and we launched it pretty quick and hired some CSRs and started selling and and calling people that we know, and we got a tree care company and then a lawn care company. And before you know it, you start to attack certain markets and had a good run of it. I um, stubbed our toe a ton. Ultimately, Brock learned it's a very tough business to scale. Um, we had no problem selling it conceptually. People understand it. Yep, Charlie, I get it. I, I need somebody. You can assign me these three CSRs. They'll figure out my business good enough. Doesn't need to be, it's not going to be perfect, but if they can understand it, great. And then we go out and sell. And then everybody like wanted these three CSRs. So these three CSRs were like supporting six different companies and a CSR would leave and then they get pissed off. We fired and it was just like, we had these like ebbs and flows, ebbs and flows. And so we, we certainly had our frustrations and made up to, to jump into the next point of the conversation here. We made a massive pivot with our business about four months ago into, into AI. So. I want to or, flesh out some of those problems with the, the customer service, like hiring actual customer service reps really quick before we pivot to the AI stuff. What were like the main challenges with having all of those people? Was it finding good CSRs that were just ready to and knowledgeable and could 
handle the load of understanding the business and providing good support. Like, um, like you said, you weren't demand constrained at all. You go to a business, it's very clear the, the value that you're going to bring to them. Are you, were you more constrained by the ability of finding good qualified help, which is essentially the same problem that the, the business owners are in, but you're just looking to just focus on that. Good question. We could find good people. I, I think we were finding good people who didn't want to go into an office every day because we were completely remote. So we could find a lot of CSRs that were working for an HVAC, plumbing, whatever home service company. We're speaking it. Okay, I can go work for free to grow. I can work from home. I'm not driving to the office. I can take calls in my pajamas and everything's okay. So we didn't have any problems there. The, the problem was trying to be, we, I think we had a hard time saying no, right? So we'd have, we'd sell ourselves as this white glove service, and then we'd get a bigger HVAC company or whatever call and say, Hey, can you guys do this when you're doing a happy call or an outbound call, or you're like, you're checking up on a quote, like do this and this. And now it's a little bit different than the other company and then the other company. And it's so it, it got hard to like first to systematize that, manage that, train that. And then maybe we'd lose the CSR, we'd sign on three more companies and they introduced three new little nuances to how they wanted things done. So it just got like really hard. Like we had every year, it was like, it was before the summer peak, we'd sign up a bunch and we'd grow like crazy. And then we'd say, okay, we probably got to bring on a few more CSRs. Wasn't enough. We got to hire more. So our revenue is going up, but our, our expense lines like creeping up to it like that. And okay, CSR leaves, or maybe we got to, maybe we got to trim to get our marks a little better. And then a company that really liked that CSR that left would get really pissed off. Hey, I like Sarah. I like Jessica. Where are they? Can we use them again? They're not here. And they'd leave. And we just had this just constant like battle and cycle that didn't seem, at least in my opinion, Nathan's opinion, I felt like it was just going to be that cycle every year. We were very open to looking at different technologies and how do we make this thing more like able to systematize that, introduce Slack, built up, built an AI tool to support our CSRs in Slack that made them faster on the phone and be able to pull up like SOPs for individual companies via Slack while they're on the phone. So like we, we made a lot of efforts to standardize it, but it just got so tough, especially as we got bigger and had more owner operators asking for individual stuff. I, we saw the running on the wall like this, this probably is going to have a limit here and not quite be the business. When we started this thing five years ago, we thought we could be supporting hundreds of these guys, but we could get like 60 clients and then we'd have this, like these scaling problems and then we'd lose a few and gain a few and winter months we'd slow down and people would say, oh, I'm a long care guy, I don't need you right now. And it was just, it just got like hitting or hiding against the wall too much in the, in the early bench. Anecdotally, I worked for several years at a customer support center for a large telecom company, first as a technical support rep and then as a supervisor with 15 people under me and man. Just I, those problems that you're talking about resonate so strongly because there is a very, especially the larger and larger company that you get, they have a very defined way that you get things done. If you have this problem with your phone, or in this case, maybe your HVAC, or you, you need to look at your lawn service or whatever, there's a sequence that you got to follow. And with enough iteration on that, a company can really dial into, hey, this is how we can most optimized for getting the customer to the happy path. Maybe it's upselling them on something. Maybe it's booking an extra service. Maybe it's any of those things that all of those things that they're trying to drive towards. And those are like, that's years and years of iteration on that. And I can't even imagine trying to train one person on multiple of those, much less a cohort of people on all of those different processes. Cause it just gets clunky and the, the yeah. whole thing that you're offering here is the white glove. You don't want people stuttering through, oh, what should I say next based on this kind of custom tree that you've built for them to follow. Yeah. We had a good operations manager. We had a business development manager and we had good systems like leverage Trello and, and different software systems and made it pretty darn good. So you, we could probably like onboard a new CSR, free to grow Cloyd, introduce him or her to three different accounts. 
and get them going in like 48 hours, right? It'd be pretty good, especially with our AI integration with Slack. It just, we just were like, man, how many more seasons can we go where we like ramp up, ramp down, deploy turnover? It, it just needed, it needed some, something new. Oh. One last question on this kind of phase of the business. What were the learnings from the previous business and your understanding of how difficult the customer support aspect was? were you trying to instill in the early phases of developing and, and training and kind of leading these CSRs, but strictly for the support purpose? Yeah. Oftentimes the customer service role can be a thankless task, right? They're up in the background, you get more operators who are out there generating leads or up on the ladder and they're hoping that somebody's picking up the phone and booking employment. So I was, I'd try to put our people in my shoes. I'm like, okay. These, our clients are paying for these leads, right? Whether through networking or, you know, or put their sweat in or they're paying an agency to, to make them findable on Google. So like these calls matter, right? Every call matters. And so we were very focused on booking, right? We had, even if we didn't have the, uh, a client's procedures down the pat, we would always encourage our CSRs to book, book the call. Even if you're not sure of a technician schedule or a salesperson schedule, we can always call back and change it, but booking the call is going to take priority, right? So that was our big focus. That was like our one golden rule, right? It, if it's, if, it, if a client can only do on a Saturday and, and our client has told us 10 times, don't book anything for Saturday, but just book it. We will figure out a way to get them back on the phone and on the calendar Monday versus we don't pick up the phone, we don't book it, and that customer goes to the next person on Google. So that was one thing. That was like one standard that we really felt like universally book it, you know, make mistakes. We can figure out the mistakes later with the person accordingly. Well, and I think that this segues nicely into the AI thing, because that trying to encapsulate what you just said is you're basically, you're moving the ball forward because like you said, if they don't, if they don't take the next step, if you don't tell the person, Hey, this is what's going to happen next, you've lost them. Somebody's yeah. got a broken HVAC, it's 110 degrees, their wife is pissed and they need somebody out right now. Getting, you know, getting the yeah. call scheduled, even like you said, even for a bad time is something happening, some kind of action taken that can, you know, even if it's not right, it's moving forward, which is what people want. So no, that's really great. And I think that is a really great way to, to talk about where you're at now. I want to maybe start with, maybe just describe what your guys' offering has morphed into today, and then we can unpack like some of the specifics of that. Yeah. I, it's a, it, yeah, it's been a wild time. So in April, my partner heard an AI voice recording on some home service Facebook group, shared it with me. And we had always been interested in the potential of AI voice going back probably a year, right? So. We made some calls and did backups. About a year ago, we had reached out to some AI developers. I'm like, how far are we from AI voice? And they're like, oh, this is years away, right? The inflections, the latency, the interruptions, the humanness of it is a ways away. Okay. When I heard this call recording, and this is like early April, I, I, I looked at I'm like, Nathan, holy cow. Okay. This is something that we've got to look at. And this was right when we were going through another big growth squirt and we're like, here we go again, right? We're going to sign up a bunch of clients and we got to hire four new people and two of those people are going to work, two are going to be gone. We got to hire another two. So we're like, this is probably a good time to start over with the business. Okay. So Nathan found, did some digging around and we found our now chief technology officer, Jerry Yee. He's an um, unbelievable guy. He's a Yee Pen dropout. He's been obsessed with machine learning since high school. He had built a language model going after home service companies. Just nobody knew about it. Okay. He was like the player coach, shooing the sales, doing onboarding, building the model. And so Nathan and I were like, Jerry, like we have all these home service relationships going back five years. I'm on a lot of podcasts. I've got Tommy Mello group and we got the garage door group. We got the home service group. I got 10,000 emails of people. We got clients now. Why don't we partner with this thing? So we ended up basically buying his IP. 
Jerry now is just focused on like onboarding and product development. So he's very happy. And Nathan and I do the, the sales and, and business development. But so this is April ish. And we had a loose agreement with Jerry and we went to, went to all of our clients, still confident enough. And we said, at the beginning in May, we're going to have be introducing AI voice, right? Here's a demo account. Here's some call recordings. This is the future. Let us know what you think. Half our clients, Brock. Was that that? more or less than you were expecting? Uh, I was okay with it. What was interesting is the clients that left didn't even open the demo account. Okay. Weren't interested. Don't care. I like like my CSR that you got. Whatever else you're telling me, I want to hear it. You know, the clients that stayed have been total like evangelicals for us, right? Gave it a shot, certainly had some bugs, but it's been great. So AI voice right now is doing pretty close to everything our former team was doing. Okay. There's certainly some nuance of stuff that we will get to that they're not doing now, but answering the phone, booking, getting information to it into a client CRM, doing dispatching. That's like our core offering right now. It is amazing. I, it's the, one of the great moves we've made. We've since all the business that we've lost, we've since gained back. We've signed clients that weren't frankly interested in the legacy free to grow model. that are very interested in what we're doing now. I think there's, you get some forward thinking home service owner operators like, yes, I get it. This is the future. Let's get going now in the model because we can tinker it. I can tinker it. I can tailor it. I can make it exactly how I want my business to operate. How I want my CSR to answer the phone and how I want them to book, schedule, dispatch. Let's go. Let's get started. So to call it like an eventful pass, like three to four months is an understatement. We have basically shifted from like an outsourced CSR business to we're a technology company now. So we brought Jerry on as our CTO, Nathan's our chief sales. I'm running point as a figurehead, business development, partnerships, et cetera. And then we, we also recently brought on another partner, Ben Brebico, who's uh, another AI researcher from Columbia in New York. So we feel like we've got probably one of the better development teams out there. And it's just a, it's a fascinating time right now, especially coming with our, the luggage that we have with free to grow 1.0. And what we learned on the customer service side, the relationships with their own service, and then seeing this, like this pivot, what I think is going to be a big pivot over the next year into AI. So I think we, we made the right move when we did, we found the right people when we did. I'm not sure how much you can share and if you can't, it's okay, but any sort of like anecdotal thing would be helpful to just get a sense for the shift in your business. But so we, how many people. Did you go from at peak earlier this year to now you've got three or four? So I'd love to know people wise and then any sort of numbers or figures you can give me on like change in sales. What has happened to the business from like the economic perspective of making this shift? Certainly your cost of goods is probably dropped by 90%, I'm sure. But what, what else could you, you speak to about the change in kind of the business model? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's not always pretty for those out there listening that want to do their own. Their April, this is April or May, we had a full-time business development manager. We had an ops manager. We had 14 CSRs. Okay. We had a very difficult time getting our business development manager and ops manager bought in. Okay. They were, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but they were not particularly supportive of this. Okay. And they were very ambiguous and unclear in communication with clients that did not, was less than helpful. Okay. So we were initially thinking we were going to have them take this, take the ball, take the AI ball around with it. We made a, we saw a couple of communications with clients and I called them within 30 seconds and ripped the bandaid off. Can't happen. That was the big pivot. Right. And then when we made that decision, we had probably five to six, it was a Friday ish. We had probably five to six CSR not even show up to work on Monday. Okay. Cause clearly there was some communication between them and the CSRs. Hey, Charlie and Nate are going this direction with AI and you may or may not be a part of the picture. And 
So we had a lot of people not even show up Monday. By right? a small business, they said, it's easy. Uh, just uh, if your easy. workforce Our, walks out. So we went from two two kind of readers to 14 CSRs. We have one, we have right now, we have one of the remaining CSRs who stuck with us. He had a computer science background, Gabrielle, and she's been great. She's our head of onboarding. So she saw the value of it, saw where it's going. And it's very valuable. It's a differentiator for us because it's nice to have somebody who's been a CSR for 20 years, know what the AI needs to sound like, knows maybe, okay, can be sensitive with client onboardings and hand holding. And you know what? I know service tight. I know house scope broke. I know all these CRMs because I've been doing it for the past five years. And I'm going to walk you through how these integrations work. So it's been a blessing in disguise. But yeah, April, May were beyond rough. I mean, clients, what's going on? Where am I to see if I didn't show up to work today? So I, you could do the AI now or you can leave. And like, okay, I'll leave. So it was rough, but we kept, we kept our most important clients, for my opinion, the kind of thought leader clients are like, you know what? Yep. Charlie, I get it. it's rough. I'll bear with you. We'll go through this together. I'll be very candid. I'll give you feedback. And now they've been, I, if I need a testimonial or a video testimonial or a YouTube clip or Hey, can I share some call recordings? They're like the first ones to raise their hand. So I'm so thankful. But yeah, it was very rough, Brock. Very like awkward. A lot of like hat in hand conversations. You don't, you try to plan those things out, but you don't know how people are going to react or what your leadership team is going to tell them or not tell them. And it was just, it was not fun. But looking back now, certainly our headcount is drastically reduced. The labor line is what it is. And it's from a managing a PL with like our cost to open AI. We can track that. It's very predictable, very forecastable. And certainly from a recurring revenue model, when we were a white glove business charging clients four to six K a month, expectations were very high, right? Not to say they're not now. Our average client account now is like probably 500 to 1500. There's definitely, with how emerging the, tech, the technology is, there's far more leniency right now. Look, I'm a, a guy on the HVAC company. He's like, get it. AI is getting better. It's going to be better next week than it is this week. Let's just keep working on this thing. And I'm here, right? I'm a partner of this thing. Where before it was tougher. It was, why did Sarah miss the call? Or it, was, it just seemed like it was a negative dynamic sometimes. People, I think, in my opinion, can see where this is going in the technology, in the improvement, in the consistency. AI is going to stick to the script. It's going to tell it what I, what we have, what it has to do every time. It's a math problem. So it's been a great pivot. It's just I can't say that enough. But to your original, it was not always pretty. So there's an interesting through line there about customer like understanding customer wants and needs as well when there's like always the common thing of like when there's a new technology for people to get off of that thing it, something needs to be like a hundred percent better for them to switch right. nobody's getting off of google search anytime yeah. soon however there there's a, the other axis that's playing on is cost and so yep. you're offering like maybe an 80% solution if we're calling white glove customer service phone calls a hundred percent, which those have defaults, people don't show up to work, but it's probably as close to a hundred percent as the old school way would call. But the other dimension of cost, when you're talking about something that's 25% as expensive, maybe even less, like you said, the leniency or willingness to try something You've got a lot of more margin for error and that's stuff that goes straight to people's bottom line. Yeah, it's well said. And look, most of the big companies right now, the benefit that we have is where AI right now is really good. They have wastes after hours, no low coverage, right? So the bar that we're measuring our AI tool up against is so low, right? The call center bar, right? You talk, you call in your typical call center. How are you? Uh, you? You're on the, you're first, you're on hold for 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Somebody says, okay, Brock, just give me your name, number, email, and, and well, somebody will call you tomorrow. That's what most people are used to paying two fifty two two dollars fifty cents a minute for that. We can set up a demo account in a matter of half an hour where AI is sticking to like a customized script, demonstrating some emotionality, escalating calls, picking out when it calls an emergency, not an emergency, 
booking in their CRM, populating the CRM, doing after hours. And they're like, yeah, just just no brainer. So we're seeing a lot of the like the market activity right now. A lot of the, the kind of attractiveness is for this after hours, right? Where a big company, you know what? Maybe I'm not quite ready to have AI pick up the phone at nine o'clock in the morning for my sweet spot, but five five o'clock to 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 seven in the morning, let's give this a shot. And tweaking the model, picking up recordings, working with our development team. Hey, let's maybe alter the script a little bit. Hey, when this kind of call comes in, if this happens, if the technician that I want texted or notified, et cetera. So that's where we are right now within AI voice, within home services, is most of the big sophisticated players are crying it for after hours. What are some of the chief complaints? You started to touch on this a few minutes ago, but what are some of the chief complaints that you're hearing from prospective customers who are leery about using this? And what are your overcomes for those objections to get them to at least try this? That's a great question. So if you're using this, you're an HVAC business, right? You, you go through an onboarding process with us. We integrate with your CRM. We do a demo account before we go into production. So you can tweak it. You can call into the line as an owner, test it, et cetera. I think this is my, I listen to a lot of calls. This is my rough assessment here. I think half of, of our clients, so the homeowner calling into the HVAC company, I think half the people calling in are picking up that it's AI. Okay. So the question then is somebody, this kind of sounds like robotic -y, what are they going to do, right? Are they going to say, is this AI? Or are they just going to go through the, the call script? It's so new right now, Brock. Some people say, ah, okay, this is AI. This is like an answer machine, right? This thing can't help me. Not knowing full well that it can. So that bucket exists. Another bucket is, which is... Okay, I'll, I'll just go through this and people sound anno annoyed. They'll get, they'll, you like, they'll have a robotic voice themselves and they'll start to spit back at the AI, right? Book appointment now, right? But they'll go through the call script, okay? That's a part, okay? And then you get people that enjoy, like, prefer it. Pick up. So we actually have a garage, big garage for a client that the owner said, hey, you know what? Let's try this. Let's introduce, let's say, hey, this is Nina. I'm the AI digital assistant for cooler garage doors. I can get your call booked in 90 seconds. I think some people, and I think this number will increase, hear that. And they go, garage door is broken. Okay, what's the issue? Ah, uh, this spring isn't working. Got it. Let's get you on the schedule. How does 10 o'clock tomorrow at work? Nope, get you 10. How about one? You're on the schedule for one o'clock. Anything else? Yep. I need your address, your email. Uh, okay. Bye. They prefer that more of a transaction, quick call. I, my crystal ball is that over time, people are going to appreciate that with AI, right? There's not this warm and fuzzy one minute becomes four minutes, let's hot out or there's whatever the sports team won, which you get that and you lose some of that with people, but it's been an interesting dichotomy. Like you have your bucket of people that are like, this thing can help me, right? Talk to an agent, right? Immediately. And then they get snarky with it, but go through the script and get their call booked. What's interesting with the people that might name people that get snarky with it after like they have a couple of questions, like, hey, wow, okay. This thing is getting my information. It's getting you on the calendar. Like they start to lighten up later in the call. And then you get your people. Like you, for example, okay, I, I, I get it. This is AI. I'm okay with it. Here, my, my HVAC, my hot water heater's been out for three days. It's a 15 year old system. I need somebody out here. How, does, how about Tuesday at 10 a.m.? AI is just listening. Yep. It can jump immediately to that part of the process. But yep. Let's get you on for 10 a.m. I just need some information. We'll get you booked. Technician's going to call you when, when they're on their way. Great. So it's very interesting right now, Brock, what we're seeing, if that answers your question.
It does. Control. And I think that yeah. you've got an interesting insight there that I had never really considered. I'm helping lead building an AI related project, customer service in nature at the company that I'm with right now. And one of the things that I hear talked a lot about in the industry is how do we make it more personal, how to replicate the human experience. But this is the first time that I've heard somebody pose, hey, what if people actually just don't want that anymore? Like they're, I think inherently we think that there's value to having that, oh, did you catch the game this weekend or whatever? But I think, yeah. and maybe this is a generational thing, like I don't freaking want to talk to people about that. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe there's like an age demographic change or, or shift there too. But I think you may be right about that people, it, it's a convenience thing. Like, why do I need to go through all of these things and spend an extra 10 minutes talking yeah. to when it's something I could do in half the time? It's the same uh, thing that we were talking about from the the business owner perspective. It's, it's I don't get the, the touchy feely, oh, this person knows me. It's Becky who I call every time. But I do it in a quarter of the time and I just can do it on autopilot or I could do it on like a, a 90 second break at work. Yeah. 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 I, people may not have a choice. I, if the, if the economics like this time next year, we're talking the way I think things are going with AI voice within home services, it's chat GPT is going to have a new release probably soon. Rate and see you know, the humanness of it, the conversational NISO, whatever the word is, it's going to be better. We're probably cutting off probably two weeks. No, we ship 200 millisecond, like speed per mill. There's these improvements that are constantly going to be better, right? So at some point, people are going to have a hard time telling it's AI. So I think with home service adoption, let's say it's a year, 18 months away. I just think the expectation is going to be there that you're going to pick up the phone and call your plumber and it's probably going to be AI. Um, you already mentioned the cost benefits of it. It's 24 seven, doesn't break down. It's going to have glitches, but it's going to show up. It's going to be very effective. It's going to pull a whole bunch of information quicker, faster, better. It's going to catalog. It's going to record the information faster. It's going to get it to your CRM more accurately. It's not going to make some mistake typing stuff in. So. If that point's going to happen, it's just what there's going to be all these different reactions to it. And I think maybe somebody wants to have a conversation. I think they can, they can, can have a little back and forth or can, you know, we have, we listen to a lot of calls and we have people calling in pranking, but calling it two o'clock ordering pizza. And so we, it's interesting look, listening to the back and forth. Ah, while our speech, this is fire night. This is a, we're an HVAC company, Columbus, we don't do pizza, anything else I can help you with. So it's not, it's just like cutting people off. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating, Brock, to watch this unfold. And my, my point of not people not having a choice, it's it just at some point it's going to become so ubiquitous and universally adopted that you're going to probably be okay or understanding that you're not going to have the conversation like you would with your neighbor. When you were talking earlier about how quickly you could onboard new customers, you said maybe half hour, maybe two tops. How many variables, I'll call them, are you able to offer like a new customer signs up? I'm assuming you have a set amount of things that you can go in and change with the model just out of the box. Like, hey, we can, we obviously are going to do the basics of like, we're going to plug it in with your CRM. We're going to say, here's the name of your company and all of those types of things. But how many other ways can you tweak the model to Tuning is probably not the right word in the context of AI because tuning is something else, but we're going to call it for this sake, tune to this specific company to make it more like what they want to hear. So we're selling ourselves as a very custom option. I, I think competitively, you're going to see a lot of entrance in this AI voice space be very commoditized. We're very cheap. We can get you up in 10 minutes. We're going to give you a, a very generic script and we're going to book your appointment in, in your Google calendar, period, the end. The big value, Brock, in my opinion, is having the formal CRM integrations, API, you're pushing information, pulling information. You've got those corporate like B2B relationships for those CRMs. So when they release product updates that, you know, support your clients that are using that CRM. Um, so that's been a big focus. Um, you know, 
what's going to be tough for those companies that just want to just do the, you know, the, the commodity. Every, I'll see that every company, every owner operator has a little bit different things, right? I want to charge, I'll charge you two ninety nine dollars for same day, but if you want tomorrow, it's one ninety nine. If you want three days now, it's this. So you like, and that changes, right? Actually, let's drop that down. They'll call us and say, hey, actually, you know what? Waive that fee, right? Leads are slow. We got to get stuff booked, waive the fee, right? So there's like account maintenance there. So that's where we want to be. Right. So we're right, right now we don't have, we've got a pretty base package, including a set amount of minutes. It's so new though, because every week we're onboarding clients that have a new CRM that we haven't seen before. So we got to integrate and then that CRM is going to do things a little bit differently. That company is like, we onboarded our first batch of roofing companies, right? They're going to have little different things that we're learning lawn care guys, right? We're listening and they're, and they're telling us stuff, but wow, wouldn't it be cool if you guys could do this? Here's a good example, Rock. So lawn care guys, right? A big frustration for theirs is rain delays, right? Boise lawn care guys, guys set routes, big rain delay or big storm comes through, can't cut the lawn, right? So he's got to sit there and call all these people and say, man, I can't come out Tuesday and I'm on Wednesday and go down his list. So we're looking at doing some functionality on the outbound side to address that concern. So my point is uh, we, we don't have, we yes, we've got a select number of voices. We can do voice cloning minutes, CRM integration is big, but I don't know, like the customization, I don't know how to put like a left and right limit on it right now, Brock, because uh, there's so many different verticals, requirements, size, technicians, dispatching, scripting, how you want to do your outbound. It just, it, it's going to be that's where the big value is going to be is spending time, spending two weeks, if you have to, getting it right for that one guy. That's where we want to be. And I think you guys are in a unique position. I am very partial and really enjoy data businesses and businesses that aggregate large amounts of data and can use that as a product in their own business. So while you guys are doing this for all your customers, maybe this is just some brainstorming. Maybe you guys are already doing this, but my, the, the gears are turning here. You've got hundreds of clients in different industries. You can sell or use, Hey, this is a lawn care company that this is the model that they use and you can follow their path because they're the most successful one. Like these are the cues that they're using or the variables that you're using. And you could even, as you, as you build out the uh, CRM integrations for the new stuff, you could even dog food your own product and have as your customers call in to make changes to their IVR, have your system be making the changes and all that while you're, and this is the beauty of AI, you're doing, you're learning a lot yeah. of things right. as you go along and you're collecting those things. And those, those insights are very valuable. Great. You want your like industry avatars. Yep. Yeah. It's so fun about Yep. So fluid right now, Brock, I, I just. I don't want to be a commodity product, right? I, I, we've got to get integrations and we get, we've got like the formal partnerships are big and taking the time to get these like individual accounts, right. Mm -hmm. And how the owner wants them. I think it's going to create so much loyalty for us. It really will. I think it will as well. I don't think that you'll regret getting established, got those yeah. relationships going and, and really focus on what the, the key value is and how you can differentiate because you guys might be a little bit ahead, but as you said, this is, there's a big wave coming very quickly behind you. Great. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to maybe just start to close up here and, and talk about maybe some of the more high level learnings We're we're talking about AI replacing customer service. Uh, there certainly is a value to a customer support rep in your business. Like at, at some point, AI is not going to be able to do everything. Okay. You people need customer support in their business, even though that it's, it may be less than before. When do you think businesses ought to think about hiring support and, and how should they work to integrate them effectively to be as successful as possible? Great question. I think if, if you look, if we're talking about this conversation with the thought that you're going to be integrating AI. I think you've got to start with what are the capabilities of AI voice, right? So it could take me from call 
to booking an appointment, right? Let's just keep it very simple. And then everything in the CRM is going to be populated. Then if, if you're at a point when I'm growing, I, I've got multiple technicians, the revenue supports it, earning supports it. What can a CSR pick up the slack on, right? Maybe we've got some like custom dispatching or you want, I'm calling like on select vendors or outbound clients or quote follow-ups or third-party aggregators. You've got to, depending on what your niche is, you've got to find what can AI do for me to cover like 70% of what I got to get done in the office. And then how can I find a CSF or CSR that can create value for my business, right? There's going to be calls that we're going to escalate that are very complicated. I want a refund or the, you know, the technician knocked my nail, mailbox over and I want to know what your plan is to get, to get me a new mailbox, right? Those kind of calls are going to come. Um, and so you're going to have running on your side, somebody there to be able to answer those, but yes. Okay. I need a, I need a CSR that can fill the gap for the stuff that AI can't do that. That's where I'm going to start. One more kind of high level question for you. Any words of advice or two cents of wisdom for a veteran looking to buy a business or maybe start something like you have here. And you were talking about the value of understanding the sales process and some questions, but anything specifically targeted at veterans that may be useful. Yeah. Pros and cons to both buying a business. You oftentimes have, you're able to avoid those, like those fatal errors depending on the size of the business you bought, typically they've already learned enough lessons to be able to sustain themselves where I feel like right now we could still make critical errors, right? Or somebody could leave or something happens and we're just nothing, right? We haven't hit that like critical threshold yet. So yeah, I buying a business, I think you're probably going to pay more. There's more, you know, risk with debt and personal finances, but you're buying a commodity that's done something reasonably well and you've buying something that's made decisions and avoided those fatal errors and is already at a certain point where it's worth buying. Um, startup, I think my one piece of advice was have, you have clear objectives. You can't like keep digging the hole and digging the hole and digging the hole and hoping things are going to get better. You've got to say, okay, at year one, I'm going to hit this revenue within reason. If I don't, if I'm way off, then I've got to take a hard look at is entrepreneurship for me. Is this the right business for me? What am I missing? And either go for it or get out fast. There could be a lot of like desire. I've put so much into this. I've got to linger a lot on my own sweat and twits. Like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. In my opinion, it either worked or it did. All your efforts are reflected in what the P&L says, right? No matter how hard you work, that's the outcome. Yeah, I learned a lot when I sold that company, it, it was a really tough, and I tried when you're negotiating with negotiations, like I made all these relationships and, you know, this is, this is the outcome of these relationships and the future values. What those relationships are is what this says right here on the bottom line. That's what that is. I, I don't, I personally don't care. Cold hard math. And I was like, he's not wrong. So oh, it just was a blank. Cause oh, no, no, no. I don't, I know people like me, they know me and they're going to be sending me more stuff in the future. And he's like, yeah, they're. They're sending you what it is right now. That's your business. A little bit of tangent there, Brock, but yeah, both, both are worth looking at pros and cons. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I would go one way or the other, but if you're going to start something from scratch on the early part, you got to do your own work, spend the time, figure out what the roadmap is, talk to some people in the space that'll, that'll listen to you and, and have a really educated guess of why you're doing it. And if it's not working, just get out fast. So this has been awesome, Charlie. I appreciate you giving us some knowledge on customer support and really exciting what you're building. I think that you're in an exciting space and you're ready to ride the wave, so to speak. What can myself or anybody listening do to be useful to you? Well, I, I, if people want to talk about entrepreneurship or buying a business, I've done most of those, or if you're interested in what the AI can do, we're, we're focused on home services, but we've been approached by many organizations that are not in home services that are interested. I think there's a lot of little offshoots that this technology can go into, especially in like troubleshooting and taking feel, taking calls for people in the field where you want somebody that can stick to the script and input information and give that information to the right point of contact. And that's great for that. Yeah. I'm a resource. I, I'll say it again. I love my time in the service and taught, taught me a lot and I think about it daily and it was a great part of my life. So I'd love to help out anybody that needs it. Fantastic. 
Charlie, I appreciate it. Thanks so much, man. Thanks, Brock.